Aloha, and welcome to another program of A Better Day. I'm State Senator Sam Sloan, and I hope that you'll join me for the next half hour as we review the 2015 State of Hawaii Legislative Session. Whew, boy. Now you only have to hold your wallet with one hand, your wallet or your purse, because we're out of session. We uh, did get out, and we adjourned on time on May 7th, and we won't be back in session until the third Wednesday in January of 2016. But during this interim, several things. We still will have informational briefings and a couple of hearings and maybe even a special session or two, particularly in the state Senate, maybe some confirmation of, of new judges. Those are things we do. But here's a tip that I always try to remind you about. This is the best time to see your legislators. If you want to talk to them about uh, a particular issue or something you'd like introduced next January, or if you would like to talk about something that's happened already, um, this is the time to do it because we're not in regular session. We're not harried by uh, committees and, and all of that on a regular basis. So take your time and do it. Now the governor, he has a couple of weeks yet to actually determine whether or not he's going to sign or veto uh, any bills or allow them to become uh, laws without his signature. So if you're interested in a particular bill and there may be a question of whether or not he's going to sign it, this is a time also you can contact the governor. Let the governor know how you feel about a particular bill. And as always, if you need any help or any support, you can get it from the uh, legislative access room up on the fourth floor of the state capitol. You can call your particular legislator or you can call my office at, at any time. We still have our staff year round and we're there to help you. That's what we do. And as far as you being a constituent, I'm old fashioned. I take it seriously from my business cards, which are not paid for at taxpayer expense, and they say state senator. So that means if you're you know, watching this program from the Big Island or from Molokai or from Kauai and you have a problem and you want some help, give us a call, 586-8420. We'll be glad to help you. We'll post that near the end of the program. Well, look, let's take a look at some of the things that, that have happened during the past session because it was a very unusual session for most of us, at least on the outside. It appeared to be more quiet than it was. But inside and behind closed doors, there were a lot of things going on. There were a lot of bills that uh, uh, got a lot of attention. Some of them didn't get very much attention till near the end of the session. I guess the interesting bill that uh, emerged from this session that had uh, most of the uh, interest and excitement was the bill about medical marijuana. And this bill uh, had started out during the year, there had been for the last couple of years, an opportunity to uh, do legalization of marijuana, decriminalization of marijuana, or medical marijuana facilities, dispensaries. And this was, in the last context, the final bill and the final action that went right down to the wire. Not only did it go down to the wire, but on the last day, when all bills were supposed to have come out of committee by a 6 p.m. deadline, it didn't make it. There was still discussion and disagreement between the House version and the Senate version, so the dispensary bill did not come about. But what happened? Well, both the House and the Senate the leadership, the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, they were able to change the rules, waive the rules, extend uh, by uh, joint acceptance. And so the bill that was technically dead came alive again and was heard in new committee and ultimately the Senate uh, accepted uh, most of the House provisions and the House accepted the Senate provisions. Long and short of it was we voted on it uh, it passed unanimously in the Senate. There were some no votes, votes in the House and reservations, but it is waiting the governor's desk right now. I've got mixed emotions about that bill and about the whole movement. First of all, let me say clearly that 15 years ago when Hawaii uh, did pass the medical marijuana bill, I was the 13th vote in the Senate to pass it. That's what you need, 13 or more, to pass a bill or change a rule. And I felt strongly that we weren't talking about recreational use of marijuana. We were talking about people that had legitimate causes to try to seek relief from pain for med uh, medical marijuana. Now, 
The debate still goes on. Some people say there's no such thing as medical marijuana, that it's just a ruse uh, to allow people to have marijuana. And certainly there have been people that have taken advantage of the medical marijuana law, and they have played and gamed the system. That's true. But some people, uh, many people as a matter of fact, uh, have gotten, sought and gotten relief uh, from medical marijuana where they couldn't do it from other painkillers uh, other than becoming totally dependent on, on drugs and, and so forth. So it was a, a matter of contention for 15 years because the law previously, without any dispensaries, was you could grow your own a certain number of, of plants and then you could harvest it and you could pre prepare it and all that. Well, for some of our older patients and for people that were um, uh, in pain or, or were not able to do a lot of things, this was really a hardship. So 15 years later, better late than never, uh, we now will have dispensaries set up in almost all the islands, not Molokai and Lanai, but Maui, the big island, Kauai, and of course Oahu. Um, we changed the law a couple of years ago to uh, put the administration of medical marijuana under the health department rather than under public safety. And there have been a number of other changes that have been provided. Again, I understand that there have been abuses and probably will be abuses of this law. But to deny patients the opportunity to try to get some kind of relief, uh, I think, is a short-sighted policy. Uh, it is true that those people that have advocated this also, for the most part, advocate decriminalization uh, and l full legalization of marijuana, as has been done in, in Colorado and, and Washington and D.C. There's a lot of money involved in this. And initially, when this year's bill came forward in the Senate, I voted against it because it was all about the money. It was all about an additional 15% general excise tax, an additional 10% sales tax, high application fees, and so forth. Well, they took the taxes out but the high application fees and the costs are still there. So it's still about money, just like the tobacco settlement is about money more than it is about education of children. And I think that's unfortunate, but that's how government rolls. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see how the uh, law, if the governor signs it or allows it to become law as is expected, we'll see what actually happens. All the things that were promised in Colorado, for example, have not happened. The revenue use has not been as great as they thought it was going to be. Um, regulations have proven to be bothersome. The black market is still there, and with all the taxes and fees that they have in Colorado, a lot of people are still using the black market because the product remains cheaper, and we still have a black market here in Hawaii. But as I say, we are expecting it will be signed into law, uh, we will have the first dispensaries as early as next year, and we'll monitor that and, and see what happens and see where we go from there. It, to me, it was also an indication of why did we have so much excitement and so much passion and so much involvement in marijuana when we didn't have it in other things, particularly in our fiscal condition, our economic condition, improving our business climate and improving the lot of every resident in the state. I wish we would have had one-tenth of the excitement for that. Well, let's take a look at some of the other things that, that happened during the session. You know, I mentioned the, um, I mentioned the economic part of the session. I can't find one bill. And remember, there were about 3,000 that were introduced at the beginning of the session, about 275 that, that finally passed. Um, I couldn't find one bill that really made your life better if you are a middle-class taxpayer in the state of Hawaii. For the poor, the very poor, the homeless, illegal aliens, a lot of things done. For the wealthy, hmm, many things that were protected or that they're able to take care of. It's just for those of us in the middle class, we're squeezed from above, squeezed from below, and I can't point to one bill that really was beneficial. Also, the most important thing is if we're talking about increasing revenues in the state of Hawaii and, and diversifying our economy, you know how we talk about diversification of sexual orientation and diversity by race and, and creed and all of that, which is all well and good, but we don't talk about diversifying our economy and our business climate, which always, always ranks among the worst in the nation. That's not just me talking. We have different rating 
services and organizations that come out almost every week during this session. And they always rate Hawaii at the bottom of the list for economic vitality, economic opportunity, uh, cost of living taxes, and so forth. We normally rate between 48, 49, or 50th worst in the nation. That's not good enough, and it doesn't have to happen because we've got a lot of good people in our state with a lot of good ideas, but they get frustrated too. They get frustrated how long it takes for government to solve or address any problem, to make meaningful changes, uh, or to really uh, have an interest in the government and the economy. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, the State Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism came out with their latest economic forecast, which they downgraded the rate of growth which they previously had indicated early in the session. Uh, and I think that's what many of us have been trying to, to get across for a long time now. The economy has not improved across the board. Yeah, there are spots that have improved, and there are some good things happening, and that's a good sign. But for most of us, we're still struggling. The cost of living here remains high. The cost of housing, uh, out of sight, food and clothing and transportation, all of these things, the basic necessities, have continued to increase while wages have not kept pace. And it's not just an easy fix to say, well, let's raise the uh, livable wage or the, the minimum wage, raise it to $15. $25 an hour. You can't do that without other consequences because somebody's got to pay for those increases. Usually business people and small business people, which make up 95% of all of our business businesses now, and they're struggling already. They're working on small margins. If you are in a union, then you feel you're protected and you have a right and an entitlement to more money. And certainly the unions came down to legislatures. They always do. And they lobbied very successfully for more money. As a matter of fact, if you take all of the union collective bargaining bills that were passed into law this year, the increases alone, not the total amount, the increases alone amounted to nearly $1 billion. Let me say it again. The increases for unionized public employees, benefits and compensation, added nearly $1 billion to what the taxpayers have to pay in this state. Now I tell you, I voted against every one of those provisions, not because I don't like public employees, not because I have anything against unions. I'm saying that we can't afford this and it was not justified, particularly when several of the governmental unions, after the election, after they had negotiated contracts last year and the ink wasn't even dry, said, well, we helped elect the new governor. Now it's time to reopen those contracts and get what we deserve. I think it's a travesty, and I think that it's something that our legislators uh, should have stood up and said no to. We give very handsome benefits and, and very good compensation for our public employees, and most of them are very good. Some of them are not. Some of them scam the system. Some of them are crooks and should be removed, but they don't. We don't, we don't take care of bad behavior in the state. We simply reward people for doing what they should not be doing in the first place. And that's one of the things. That's our objective here. That's what you send us here to do, to have oversight on the finances. Because look, when somebody comes in here asking for more money, it's not money that we, the legislators, give them. It's your money. We take it from you and give it to them. So when they thank the House Finance Committee or the Senate Ways and Means Committee, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for the appropriation and for the budget amount or, or the grant and aid. They really should be thanking you. But we are not doing our job of, of oversight, and that's why there are millions and millions of dollars that are either misspent, misappropriated, not accounted for, and we don't do that because it's not our money. We're not as, um, I guess, as responsible as we should be. Keep that in mind because next year is an election year. And when somebody comes and asks you for money and for your vote, you ask them what they did for real transparency and for accountability. Look, I was the only one that voted against the state operating budget this year. Why? The two-year operating budget is $26 billion. Let me say that again. $26 billion. Look, 
We also have uh, a budget for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, OHA. We also have a separate budget for the judiciary. We have grant and aid requests. We have the collective bargaining that I spoke about a, a few moments ago, and we have additional direct appropriations for programs and, and for line item um, amounts that we fund, or I should say that you fund. This is a lot of money. We're not sure that, first of all, all the money is accounted for, but more importantly, we're not even sure that when we give money for a particular program or for a project, that it gets done. We don't do the follow-up that we should do. Now, the legislative auditor does a really good job when the legislature asks her to do an audit of a particular program, and she makes recommendations. But here's where we fall down again. We don't follow up on those recommendations oftentimes. And so there will be one, two, three, four audits of the same problems, uh, calling attention to the legislature, the need to change, but we don't do it. And what can we do in the legislature? Well, look. We've got the power of the purse. And so when an organization uh, or an agency or a program comes in and asks for money, we should pick up the papers and say, okay, this is what you said you were going to do last time. Let's see what you actually did. You didn't do it. You didn't finish it. Great that you have explanations and excuses. But here's the thing. Until you do what you said you were going to do a couple of years ago, we're not going to fund you anymore. We're not going to do it. Well, now that sounds maybe harsh or non-compassionate, yet it's the most compassionate thing that we can do because it's compassion for the taxpayers who pay for all of this largesse. So the money, the total budget, plus unfunded liability, don't forget that, the state employees retirement system and state employees health system, that adds another $22 billion. So we're talking about real money here. And if you're wondering why even your two jobs don't pay for everything you need to do, this is part of the reason. Hold your legislature accountable. Talk to them. And as I say, this off-season, the interim, this is the best time to do it. Get their attention. Make sure you talk to your legislator, not just a staff member, because you're paying for all of us and you deserve it. Well, next to the medical marijuana bill, the most controversial bill during the 2015 legislative session was the extension of the rail uh, for the city and county of Honolulu. As I like to call it, the train to nowhere. The 20-mile route that's supposed to go from the fields of Kapolei uh, to Alamoana Center. Now, the mayor, Mayor Kirk Caldwell, the city and county of Honolulu, I give him a lot of points for being a great lobbyist. I think he was down here at the Capitol more than he was running the city and county of Honolulu. That's why he's recently thrown up his hands on what to do with the homeless. He was down here lobbying for more money. What did he want? He wanted an unlimited extension for that 0.5% general excise tax surcharge that we pay on Oahu. He wanted it to go beyond its uh, cessation date right now of 2022 forever. Well, the legislature wasn't about to give him that, but they were about to give him 25 years. So his fallback position was, okay, add another 25 years, 25 years. They haven't even performed the way they were supposed to. Less than 10% of the rail is completed. And if you live out in Pearl City or IAEA, you know the daily nightmare of, of the construction. But still, the mayor wanted more money. Why? Because the original project, which was $3 billion, went to $5 billion, went to $6 billion, and then is nearly $1 billion in the hole already. So he wanted more money just to complete what they promised to complete at $3 billion. I oppose that, and I argued that my colleagues should oppose it also. The governor indicated that he was not in support. Why extend that surcharge now when here we are in 2015? We've got another seven years till 2022. But in the end, the majority, not everyone, but the majority, voted to extend that for five years to 2027. It's still on the governor's desk. There's a possibility that he might veto it, um, but we'll see. If you want to weigh in on that, send a note, call, email Governor David Ige. It is a travesty. The mayor was also here talking about even more money, another $4 billion to extend the rail, which is not completed, to Kapolei City, uh, on the west end and to the University of Hawaii on the east end. 
This project I cannot see ever being completed, not going downtown. The disruption, the cost overruns, the problems, the Hawaiian EV, all of these things say it's not a good plan, it never was, and it should have been light rail, not heavy rail, and the routes should have been uh, more carefully adjusted. But, and even the technology, the oldest technology there is, heavy rail, steel on steel. But you're starting to pay the price right now, and the worst part is everybody, including the mayor now, agree with those of us that were plaintiffs in a lawsuit for two years that it's not about traffic or relief of congestion because it won't do that. Um, it's about transit-oriented development with the emphasis on the word development. Uh, it was uh, supposed to be about jobs, union jobs. 10,000 10, were promised. Less than 2,000 have been guaranteed. And we're dealing with foreign governments and foreign manufacturers. Um, so we've got environmental concerns and, and all of this, and yet let less than 10 percent but the legislature, in its wisdom, or lack thereof, has just extended it for another five years. How much is that in real money for you? It's $1.3 billion of new taxes on top of the existing taxes. And the general excise tax, the most regressive tax there is because it does affect the purchasing of the lowest of low incomes and, and the lowest of middle incomes. But bad deal, but we did it. You can let us know how you feel about these things. And again, uh, still weigh in with the governor. Uh, another project that uh, I think uh, is of interest and we should talk about, and that's the Hawaii Health Connector. Now, look, in all full transparency, I was the only one that voted against the creation of the Hawaii Health Connector several years ago. I said it was a bad business plan. It was costly. It was bureaucratic. We had the nation's first prepaid health care act enacted in 1974 which worked had no additional bureaucracy no additional cost but this health connector what a scam a private nonprofit semi government organization that took 204 million dollars from the federal government to get its website up and running and to provide for those people that didn't have health care what it really did was have a lousy um, website that still doesn't work and siphoned off people from both Medicaid and from COFA, the Compact of Free Association, uh, the Micronesians, put them, added them, transferred them from MedQuest uh, and from Medicaid, transferred them so that the numbers got up to 30,000 or 35,000. The problem was in their initial business plan they said they needed a hundred thousand to break even and they thought that the goal of 150,000 people signed up was achievable. It's not. They haven't made any of their financial commitments. And even though they had a change in leadership, and even though they tried to cut some costs, the question now is whether or not they will continue uh, after September of this year. If you were a betting person, you'd bet they won't. Because in addition to the 204 federal million dollars, they wanted 28 million from state funds. They didn't get the 28 million. Then they wanted 5 million. They didn't get the 5 million. The legislature did give them $2 million. And again, that's still on the governor's desk. Um, they're saying that with the $2 million, they can't operate. They can't pay all of their bills. So why do we have them? We should have gotten an exemption from the very beginning to allow our successful prepaid health care act to remain. We didn't do it. There's no sense sending good money after bad. That applies to the rail, but also to the Hawaii Health Connector. It should be shut down. We should be able to go back to the Prepaid Health Care Act and then guarantee that we get back to the range of 97, 98 percent of all the people covered. But there'll be more debate on this. There is an oversight committee on the Health Connector, and it's due to meet again shortly. And I'll keep you posted. Well, finally, we have something in the legislature that we authorize called SPURBs, or Special Purpose Revenue Bonds. Now, it's not a liability to the state, but the state does issue them and gives a favorable uh, interest rate to whoever the SPURB recipient is. Initially, it was very narrow. It was for educational projects or for um, health care or, or something of that nature. Hawaiian Electric Company and its, its family of companies came in this year 
for $80 million in SPURBS as part of an $800 million renovation while they're going on with talks for the merger with Nextera. Again, I voted against that SPURB. I usually support the SPURBS, but I voted against this. I don't feel that Hawaiian Electric <coughs> has a reason for getting $80 million at um, tax subsidized rates. And I think it's just a bargaining chip to help with their negotiations, which is still being analyzed by the Public Utilities Commission. So this, again, is something for the governor to sign or not sign, and it's something for you to, to weigh in on. My office will continue to do the analysis prior to any merger. Uh, you may recall that just recently the Hawaiian Electric stockholders didn't have enough people that voted. Uh, we require a supermajority in the state of Hawaii. They didn't have it. Well, these are just some of the samples of things that you should be concerned about. Why? Because they affect you and your family. They affect your ability for choices and for uh, the ability to, to take care of yourselves and, and to um, really have economic freedom and choice. And that's what a better day is all about. Not a new day, not a new beginning, but a better day. You're entitled to it and you pay for a lot of government, you're entitled to the best government that you can get. Look, I appreciate your joining me. Hope your summer starts well and, and you have good time. If you need any information, though, at any time, please call me directly or my office. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Aloha and have a better day.